So, okay, you've got. It's very. It's highly unlikely that we, you would be choosing to place a fire stair at at a point in the design where you've got you know chairs and walls and doors in your um in your design, but you can still use this script to work out if it's working. Like if putting a wall and a door in is actually going to break the system. You you could be teetering on on a nice edge with, with that forty meters if you suddenly chuck some walls in here, right? Um, and so like a designer might have to put a, a cross walkway through there. But we we want to use the same code to be able to access that stuff. Um, so one thing that um, one thing that I find it becomes quite useful when you start writing these types of scripts is the ability to access and query uh, geometry automatically instead of uh, like manually selecting it. So in this case here, we're grabbing that slab by selecting the slab. Um, there are methods in Grasshopper that allow you to select things in Rhino and also in Revit automatically as they're drawn. Um, has anyone spoken to you guys about human or elephant before? The um, second years? I'm going to assume no. Okay, cool. So someone's mentioned Elephant to you. Good. Okay, so um, just so you're aware, there's this vanilla um, grasshopper component called Geometry Pipeline. Um, you can tell it to go pick up uh, types of geometry. So in this case, if I double click point, see how um, just by double clicking that, it's picking up from every layer, with every object, it doesn't matter what it's named, we're grabbing all points and there, that it's grabbing that point there. If I draw automatically in the system, it's able to pick up all those points all at once. So these pipelines or queries, uh, they happen automatically. Um, the, I don't like this component because it doesn't let you um, enter these variables in as inputs. You have to manually control it. Um, human, which is a very useful plugin, um, has its own uh, dynamic geometry pipeline, um, which then lets you define the layer, the type, and the name based on inputs. Um, so if you interested humans, humans are useful plugin there. Elefront also does the same or something similar. Um, Elefront lets you reference by a certain thing. So, you know, reference by type and we could pick, you know, point. Uh, but then if you want to do any other filtering by layer and whatnot, you, you then have to run them through these, these types of filters. So humans, probably the best, uh, dynamic geometry pipeline system, uh, the people writing the components to connect to Revit have made a f series of functions called query elements or query view elements or query element, blah, blah, blah. So using query elements works very similarly in uh, to the dynamic geometry pipeline. You basically give it um, <clears throat> a series of conditions that an object must meet for that object to then be queried by Rhino or Grasshopper, sorry. So these filters exist um, in the this filter section up here. There's a whole bunch. Um, so you could just say, hey, go get every object based on the level. Um, but in this case, what we want is we want to use the category filter. Um, and in that we can place uh, a model category so uh, in these in this input section, uh, they've just predefined a lot of the 
the nice uh, Revit categories that um, I absolutely love. Like, isn't this just amazing? All of these different categories that you could possibly want, um, but it can never change. What I don't understand is um, there's a category for furniture, but there's no category for fixtures. Does not make sense. What's going on, Revit? Um, bu -bu 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 -bu. So what we want to do is we want to go grab walls. That goes into the category there. That plugs into the, the filter. And this thing is immediately going to go grab all the, the Revit walls um, in the model. And we can't see them because we haven't told it to, to preview the geometry yet. Um, and what you'll find is by default, it's going to limit that to a hundred walls. If your job, if your project's got more than a hundred, you might, it will give you a warning and you need to set that. That's just preventing you from breaking the whole script potentially. If you, um, if that's set too high, in this case, I've only got 11, so I'll just leave that alone. Um, so once that's queried, we should be able to use uh, the element geometry component. If you plug your walls into that, that will then uh, give you walls uh, uh, as B-wraps and it will also make sure that if you've got penetrations through those walls, such as you know one for a door, um, those penetrations will show up in the model. And you see there, I've just modeled that extra door in uh, because we've set that as like a dynamic pipeline <clears throat> without having to go reselect the door or the wall or whatever, that penetration has appeared there. Cool. So what we need to do is we need to, we're, we're going to basically go and grab everything that we think is going to be a, uh, a hindrance on our uh, people as they're trying to leave to get to their fire exit. So um, these tears and the, these tables are going to get it going to get in the way. So the category that these belong to is furniture. So we can query furniture. And that'll pick out those. Um, and we also have some structural columns. So we'll grab them as well. Now, and th this could be um, like, you might have to go through various different filtering systems depending on, on the model. Um, but th these are just demo like just to demonstrate this stuff. Structural columns. So there they are there. Cool. So it's very, it's, it's a lot, it's very simple to be able to go pick your objects now because um, we just need to know the category or something about them, like their level um, to be able to pick them up. So walls, walls are going to come in as B reps and um, we're going to do, we're going to use walls slightly differently to the other the other two objects in that we, because our walls are usually thin and long, we're actually going to grab their bottom surface or bottom surfaces. So very similar to what we've done here with the floor plate, grabbing the top surface, we're going to grab Uh, sorry, we're going to explode them first. We're going to deconstruct them. Um, and if we just grab the first bottom surface, um, for most of these walls, that'll be good. So you can see here, uh, let's just um, hide everything. We can see that we've picked out uh, this surface there and this one, that's great. But uh, in the case of a wall that might have a penetration through it, because our door is uh, penetrating uh, and producing 
more than one bottom surface, this method doesn't work. So um, what we need to do is we need to pick out the we need to pick out more than one item um, using this this sort method, kind of. So how how do you go about doing that? We can we can use these uh, set functions. Um, is have I shown everyone uh, what a set is yet? Is everyone familiar with sets? Have you done sets? We've done sets with Python as well. So, so a set, um, a set is basically a list of items where an item uh, is every item is unique. So in this case, um, we've got heights of our the heights of our um, cent centroids. If I were to create a set of this, you can see that three meter one, three, 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 that repeats three times with a create set uh, that is gonna get rid of that rep repeated element and just produce once. Cool, so with that, we've, we've gotten rid of, we've, gotten rid of all the um, duplicates and we can sort our our set to get the the lowest number so in this case with all of these it's it's three because they're all drawn on the same level um, then member index this function if you if you have a like a series, so uh, all of these Z values per branch, so there's um, eight, there's eighty eight branches. So then there can't be eighty eight walls. So I guess there must be. Ah, uh, they're branching per um, per wall as well. That's cool. Okay, so we've got all of these these branches with the various heights um, of those points, we can then say, well, we, we only care about the, the three meter high ones. So if you go find the indexes of those, those indexes are um, for this wall, two, three, and four. The second wall is just two. There's another wall, which is this one, which is two, three, and four, and the rest are two, 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 two. So instead of using this sort list method, um, we've now got a series, like a list of indexes that we, we can use to pick out those, those bottom surfaces to use for blocking the, the calculation. Cool. So we can we can do a lot of weird and wacky things right now. We could um, very simply, not simply, we could go and trim our base surface, this floor plate, um, and then remesh it um, using these using these surfaces to trim. Um, but what I'm thinking, just to make this, um, like you guys know how to trim surfaces and stuff, right? <coughs> Actually, we probably have to do it. What I was thinking was, so if our sample rate's small enough, we're going to have a path going through these doors no matter what. Um, so if I set this path to a meter... should turn off that um, that everything calculation shouldn't I let's give it a sec is everyone um, clear with what we did in that previous section though with the like how to get multiple uh, low values instead of just you know one
Bro. Yeah, let's just do the the mesh trim method. I think that's probably going to be easier once this once this runs. Um, whilst we wait for this, um, am I correct in thinking that next week is meant to be the the teaching break? It is. Of course, Tom knows when the holidays are. Um, yeah, I know. Yeah, every student. So, we what we were going to do because um, because I'm trying to be in Adelaide. If um, COVID doesn't overtake Sydney in the next few weeks, I'm going to try and be in Adelaide. Um, after Easter. So next week is the teaching break and the week after that is Easter. So next week, um, do you, let's run another class on online during the teaching break. And then the week after Easter, you'll have a, you can have a week off. Is every, everyone's cool with that, right? Uh, the next assignment can can be due uh that the week that we have off after Easter. Yeah. Yeah, they've got they've got lots of time. Cool. So Okay, I've just turned some of this off just so that it runs a bit faster. Um, so we, we can do, we can do this a few ways. The one way is if you're sampling enough, then what we can do is we can just work out, um, if there is a connection, uh, between two vertexes to break that connection. Um, but if we do that, it's a, it's complex because we're using the mesh function. We actually have to get rid of this Get, we either have to turn this into li a line network um, rather than a mesh one. So what's probably easier is doing that trim right now. So um, <clears throat> <coughs> let's go get into B rep trimming. Don't we just love B rep trimming? Isn't it the most fun? Surface split. Okay, so we're gonna go. We're gonna turn all of our um, wall surfaces into curves. We're gonna flatten them, and we're going to split our surface, our base floor plate surface, by them. That's gonna produce us a lot of surfaces. If we just pick out one, that's not gonna be the right one that we want. So we, you know, we get back to the that this sort of method of measuring the area and picking out the the largest one. If we measure the area of all of these surfaces, um, oops, no, we don't want list item. We just want that one. Yep. So we measure the area of each of these. We sort them by their area. And we pick out the largest one that should give us the one that represents the floor plate. Does that, I like, was that too fast for you guys? That little coding snippet? No. Nope. Okay. Cool. So we should be able to plug that back in to our mesh B rep, and then the the system is now sampling like through those doors into the into the rooms um, and if we just go have a quick look at our single point system and we place out like we decided to put a um, 
a fire stair entrance here, let's say, then we can see that that's still satisfying the conditions through through those doors there. And actually, you know, the, the fact that there are walls uh, hasn't necessarily changed much uh, for the that scenario. But, you know, let's throw, let's grab one of these doors and move it. to over here and we've made a fairly unsafe oh the wall is dead why is the wall dead that's an interesting one it's just um project these, it doesn't matter if these are uh, in 2D for this analysis. So if we project them, they, we make sure that they're all on the same plane, but that's, um, that's broken. Ah, the bugs to do with Revit. What do we do? Let's just retry to draw this wall, see if that fixes it. It looks like it did. It's an interesting one. Um, but there you go. So we can see because of the, the way that's oriented, we're going, we have to get from there to that, that point along the wall up to the door and then walking into that room. And so that means that, you know, that's an unsafe room in terms of fire. So, like, if there's going to be doors, it they, they can't be there. So, um, how would you do that for columns and furniture? So, I rather than um, <clears throat> rather than trying to get the base surface because, you know, maybe like columns might work. Columns might work. Um, but if what. Is there a more universal um, approach to this than sort of like breaking down a uh, an object and then getting its base surface? Because if we do that with these chairs or ta tables, it it's it's not necessarily going to tell us the information that we need. So um, one method that I would use is. Uh, if you can turn your your object into a mesh, what that's going to do is it it'll mesh everything um, fairly easily. So in this case, this is a weird one. It's there's like. Am I doing columns? Or, no, it's furniture. Check this out, Leo. You see this table? It's made up of like two B reps. How's that possible? Yeah, but but Rhino Rhino doesn't know B reps like that. It's That's so, that's so weird. I've never, ever, ever, ever seen a B-Rep do this. No, but, but, but Rhino can't, yeah, this is, Rhino can't, this is the first time I've ever seen a non, like a disjointed B-Rep be, be thought of as one object. That's so weird. Maybe you can do it now. That's strange. Okay, cool. So, uh, so yeah, this stuff surprises me all the time as well. I like, hence why you'll you I'll just be like, what? I've never seen that. Teaching always teaches me stuff because 
uh, I end up doing stuff that I normally don't do. Um, okay, so the reason we're doing we're turning this into a mesh is that there are there are these cool functions that you can do with meshes that really you know, you can only do on meshes uh, efficiently, and this particular function that we are going to use is um, the mesh shadow. So shadow, it basically will draw a ray. It'll work out the silhouette um, of the mesh because of the way um, the way mesh edges work. There's there's no curvature. It's all polygons, so it can very simply work out what that silhouette is relative to the normal of the ray. Um, so if we if we mesh join our meshes, that'll make sure that the chair legs, these table legs are the same mesh as our um, tabletop. If we plug that into the mesh shadow component, we put a Z, a Z direction for the light. I think that's defaulted anyway. And that needs to be a negative one because we want the light coming from above down. And we put a an XY plane, which is also the default. That'll guarantee that we have um, like the the plan silhouette of our object as curves um, drawn onto our onto our floor plate. Oh, so we we could technically just um, chuck anything that we know. Like the the reason we have to do walls is that a different way is because we need to know where the penetrations are but you know we're not going to have penetrations with columns so we can throw uh, our columns into the same the same system and that there we go we get those going <laughs> and we could we could even offset these curves if we really want but let's just um let's throw them into the trim so i'm going to throw them into that um the projection Actually, let's just flatten this first. I think I've broken the script. Yeah, I've broken the script. Ah, oh, shit, I put it in the wrong one. Ah, one thing, you guys wanted to know what... Um, Short, there was some shortcuts that um, I mentioned last week. Um, there's another one that I, I forgot that I, I just used in a, uh, the other day and I remembered. If you, um, if you click on a component and you hold control left, uh, like left, and, uh, left on the, the keypad, on the keyboard, it will step up, like left of the stream in the in the script so you know that that'll go to the the two leftmost inputs um and you can do that with right as well so that'll go to the outputs of that component so we can step along um and if the the components branch they'll they'll branch out if you do that uh holding shift it will select components so you can say okay um, hey, let's turn off everything in my script. Um, and we just want to see the outcome of the construct mesh. So we can hold control shift and left and that will select every, eventually select every component that would eventually end up controlling that last one. And then we can run that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, if you've got like a if you've got a f more complicated thing than what I've got, rather than um rather than grabbing the the element geometry, uh there's a Revit component in here that lets you grab the bounding geometry. Sometimes it doesn't work though. 
um, because the person who's made the family hasn't defined a bounding geometry for that. Um, so you you could, yeah, I know. I'm I'm get, bear with me. So you can you can also use uh, the rhino. <laughs> Uh, bounding box function just make sure that when you plug that in that you right click it and set union box so that way um, it's <clears throat> uh, connected it's it's grabbing everything not just grabbing um, the individual shapes and then uh, there's a real like if you've got something as simple as like a bounding box and you want to turn that into a mesh rather than plugging that into a mesh b rep component you can plug that into a simple mesh it, it takes a lot less time it doesn't have to calculate many things it just creates a, a mesh box and you can use that guy instead oops we don't need that we <clears throat> we can plug that in um there is also some settings on this element geometry um you can see there's a detail level you can set that for like to be coarse, medium, or fine. Um, if someone's modeled, you know, a table and there's like lots of little handles and details on there that are just, you know, completely unnecessary for this exercise. If they haven't made that family um, in a way that has like levels of details that is coarse, um, then they've made a, an annoying family. Um, you should be able to set this to course and, and be able to just get the rough uh, geometry from that. I've got some chat where disconnect and reconnect the walls from Geo in Grasshopper. What's this? Is that is that an old comment? Ah, oh, I see what you've done. Yeah. Yeah, that was back when the wall was broken. Cool. So, um, imagine you've got like a bar, like... We, Normally tables, these, I think this is a coffee table, but you know, this could be, um, this could be a desk. Do, do, do. So if we just copy that guy and throw, is there no like copy multiple? Come on, rabbit. So that wall of uh, coffee tables now is going to have an effect on on this analysis, you know. Because you get you get to this point, like if I actually pull up the um, the branching that's being calculated, you, know, you have to you have to walk through here to, to to be able to get to any of these points, right? So um, the way desks are laid out in offices have to consider um, those fire safety rules. We just be mindful of that as well. Um, and then what else? What do we need to do? Okay. So you guys have got um, you guys have kind of got the tools in your bag to be able to set grids out, um, put columns on those grids, uh, draw stairs I've, i think i've and um uh to be able to set them out and, and actually like create fire stairs and and actually do patterned surface production to to produce um stairs that are a little bit more complex than just fast stairs you we've also got the ability to analyze a floor plate um, and test where like if a if a fire stair were to go at a certain place, where can it actually service? What's its catchment? Um, but at the same time, 
uh, we can then also analyze the floor plate and work out where the most efficient places to put fire stairs are for for fire purposes, not necessarily structurally. Um, so with these tools, we could technically progress your buildings, uh, the ones that you produced for assignment one, and get uh, a structural grid system going, get some fire stairs and um, service cores running through it, um, and place those sta those fire stairs in appropriate places in the building. And so that effectively, taking all those um, ingredients um, is the the next step for assi is assignment two. So, assignment two is effectively fleshing out the internals of the building that you produced in assignment one. Um, it's what we need is uh, floor plans and sections provided, and those those sections should cut through uh, uh -huh. things like your fire steps, um, and it's probably best from your efficient perspective that most of that those sections and floor plans are produced via Revit. Um, but uh, I'm not, I won't hold it against you if you don't, but um, you'll probably end up with better ones from Revit. Also, it'll give you an opportunity to um, try and get Revit to look okay, decent at least semi-decent what what we don't need is for you to lay uh walls out or anything like that for for the floor plate um and then also prove that the fire stairs are located in a reasonable position the points that we're using to do these calculations are um they're the the point of where the door would be to get into the fire stair. Um, so prove that they're in a reasonable location, like that, that they're actually satisfying uh, the fire stair conditions and maybe also prove that they have been placed based on um, these efficiency rules. Does that make sense? Cool. So, um, one thing, one thing I will point out. So you remember the that sort of like eighty five percent efficiency thing that we were were playing with in assignment one for the FSR. The um, that efficiency effectively comes in play with those fire stairs. So if you put put a fire stair in, it's it's going to take away from uh, your your FSR. So when you do draw your fire stair, also consider providing us, you know, what the impact is of those fire stairs with the floor plate area um, and its impact on the FSR. Because uh, if you're aiming for 85% and you've built to the boundary of, like built to the limits of the 85%, but you've managed to make a floor plate. What? Oh, it's a video. Um... You've made a floor plate that's, um, you know, just on the limits, but your um, your fire stairs are not, uh, they're large, they're smaller, or that you don't, you only need a, a certain amount, or there's more of them, then you might be able to change your um, your floor plate a little bit. One thing I will throw in is if you want to challenge yourself for this assignment, um, go and put some floor to floor uh eight like voids in some of the levels so you know uh this particular um building in one Bly street you can see someone has they've designed this floor plate to be two like one office over two levels and there is a stair actually it looks like it's between three 
So there's a stair that connects down to the, the level below. And then there's a similar stair that connects up. Actually, th this drawing doesn't make sense, does it? Uh, maybe it does. So yeah, there's a stair from below coming up. And then, and then you come around and you go, you jump on this stair and you come up again. So, um, because we've got the stair script and because you, you guys kind of understand other than just, um, I, I'm encouraging you guys to try and create some, uh, expressive connections between the levels instead of just fire connections between the levels. And, and that's kind of where you can get a little bit, bit more creative in this assignment because um, stairs and at least feature stairs, um, actually none of these are, are legal, but whatever, <laughs> whatever, cool stairs. I should never type cool stairs in because they'll, ne they'll never work. Um, Renzo piano stairs. Stairs can be these beaut like just beautifully designed uh, things that you know, considering like how the balustrade works, and um, in this case, Brent, this architect didn't have to make these um, opaque rises, but you know, I've got this uh, regular connection and hangers that hold hold that stair up. You know, you can see there's no uh, structural elements sitting underneath it, but you do have this little guard rail to stop people from walking under it to hit their head. Um, but there's there's a real um, fun exercise in designing good stairs. And so I, I encourage you guys to, to um, extend yourselves with the stairs in this assignment. And the, the stuff that we got for assignment one, that's like, as in a, a PDF that with images that communicate your, um, what's NY vessel, New York vessel. Ah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Technically, um, these are, yeah, these would be legally workable stairs, right? Especially because there's people using them. And this is nice uh, copper inlay on the inside. And it looks like the, the soffit is also the, that sort of like shiny copper. It's while well, it's under construction. Maybe. Is that copper or maybe it's timber? No, it's copper. So yeah, have some fun. Have some fun with the stairs um, in between each each level, please. That's that's where um that's where your creative creativity can come come through. Because it's very hard to be created with fire stairs. Um, any questions? You don't know. So what we're what we're doing is we're going to just design. Um, It's what what we call what we call it in the industry would be like a cold shell, um, and so it's basically the build. What a tenant might do uh, is they might say they only want like half the floor plate, and so they'll um, they'll only rent half the floor floor plate, and someone else someone else will get the other half, and there'll be a wall that divides them. And so what you'll end up finding is that with commercial floor plates, at least, um, it's very, we'll, we'll have to actually design like 10, not 10, 
like five different options for how walls are configured across it. Um, and you have to consider quite a lot of things, things that I haven't taught you guys. So don't worry about walls. But you've got, you've got to pick a reasonable place to put your fire stairs and argue, like show us, show us why they're there. Um, but that being said, putting a, a nice void in, um, some buildings will allow tenants to put a penetration into their slab. So, you know, you've got a, you, you come into your, your new office, um, and prior to that, you know, there's been, there's been six months of fit out work. And part of that fit out work was putting a hole in the slab to put a stair in. Um, that's only feasible if someone has designed the structural system to allow for like stairs in certain places. Um, so some buildings, what they'll do is they'll, um, they'll, they'll put those uh, atrium penetrations in and then if someone doesn't want them, they'll, they'll just put floating floors over there. They, they won't be a slab. Um, so let's design our building as if it, it's got some eight, some atriums in it, um, permanently built in, not, not something that a, a tenant would ask for once they move in. So should we spend the rest of this lesson starting on assignment two? Um, and you guys can uh, throw questions to me and Leo as you work. That way, instead of starting the assignment in in a week or a half's time, like you did, like most of you did last assignment, I'll give you a chance to work on it in class. Cool. Go for it. It's very recent. It's very recent. Um, so answer, look, Dynamo is an answer to Grasshopper actually like from the, in terms of the, the um yeah yes and no so like i don't know i don't know mcneil very well uh like the people who make rhino uh, but i know a few people who know them and i know that they're super relaxed they're like um the guy uh bob mcneil he he just wants to build boats. I think, have I said this already to you guys? No, he, he just likes building boats. Um, he made, so he likes making boats. And so, you know, ages and ages ago, he was annoyed that there was no software that was good enough for him to help him design and build boats. So he made Rhino. Um, and instead of making Rhino a boat building software, he did something really clever, which was he just went, well, let's just make this uh, be able to do NURBS. Let's not put boats or jewelry or architecture or whatever on it. Let's just say that it's um, you know, a NURBS modeling package and and we'll go from there. And so that's kind of where where Rhino came from was was that the the person, someone who wanted to use Rhino built Rhino. And that most software is kind of built from people wanting wanting an outcome. Yeah, yeah. So um, from McNeil's perspective, though, that's all they've really cared about from from the beginning. So when um, Autodesk came along and said, "Hey, we want to buy Rhino," um, McNeil said, "Well, but then I'm not going to be able to use it to build my boats." So they just, they didn't sell it. They, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah, no. So, like, most programs have in this sphere have ended up just getting purchased by Autodesk, right? So, like, Maya didn't used to be an Autodesk product, and now it is. Yeah. Or, like, you, you get your uh, beh- behemoths, like Adobe. Like, uh, Macromedia used to be a, co- a company that made Flash and Dreamweaver, and then Adobe bought them and they all yeah yeah so mcneil was like no we we just want to make boats and and like we're pretty happy with our revenue stream and uh people came along and just said well i want to make like i've made this thing called grasshopper and mcneil went oh that's cool um let's just put it in rhino so it was like Grasshopper was just a free, uh, it was a plugin that was being made by this guy called Daniel Piker. It's still, he's still involved with it. Um, but he, he was like very focused on user interface. Like if, if anything, he obsesses over it a bit too much. Um, and he built Grasshopper very quickly. McNeil said, hey, this is actually pretty cool. They hired him. They made Grasshopper free. Um, so it was a free plugin for Rhino. And um, they just basically gave him free reign to just keep developing it. Um, so it was, for about 10 years, Grasshopper was work in progress for Rhino. Um, so 2000, and I started using Grasshopper for Rhino in... 2009 or 8 um, and it only just sort of come out in 2007 and by the time I was using it there was quite a lot of stuff for it like Kangaroo existed it had already taken off it was very quick um, uptake and I think throughout that um, Autodesk were like purchasing quite a lot of trying to purchase it over and over again and there was this guy, I, I don't know his name, but um, he was like, Grasshopper's amazing. It's a really good entry level to coding, especially for people who are visual. Visual coding, um, like from a design perspective, is, is a, like getting your mindset into typing Python into Revit or into Rhino is hard, but the that sort of like visually connecting things and and seeing something get built. Um, Yeah. 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 And and I honestly think now that like, we'll we'll put, we'll just put a pin in that one because that entry level to coding grasshopper is amazing at it. Right. So, this guy went, okay, I really like Grasshopper, but I use Revit. Like, I have to use Revit in my day-to-day job. So, he went and started, I guess, the same way that Daniel Piker did, um, making, a like, a free plugin for Revit called Dynamo. Um, and uh, that's kind of when they just... Basically, like the the concept behind them are both both very similar. It's a visual environment where you can connect nodes up and and get them working. Um, but the these are both systems that just basically put a visual layer over the API of the software. So when you draw a line in Grasshopper, Grasshopper is just actually saying, hey, Rhino, can you draw a line, please, from from this input to this input? And Revit in Dynamo, Dynamo is telling Revit to do that, just draw a line from here to here. And Revit's geometry engine is, is just a complete clusterfuck compared to Grasshopper's and Rhino's. Because Rhino says hey, this is a line, I don't care what it is, um, like, is it representing a wall, is it representing whatever, it doesn't care, it's a line. Um, whilst Revit says, no, the intrinsic base of everything that we do is that it needs to be drawing, like, an architectural element. 
So we, even though you're drawing a line, we need to know what level it's on. Um, is that line representing uh, a dimension? Is it representing a, a wall, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it can't be just a line. Um, and so the Dynamo, Dynamo system was reasonably good. Like the guy who made it wasn't necessarily as focused on user interface as what the Grasshopper guys are. So if you look at it, it looks a little bit clunky, but as well, it runs clunky because it's running on Revit. Um, Autodesk purchased it. They said, okay, this is great. We'll purchase it. The, the thing that happens though with Autodesk is they they basically wait until something's like amazing and they'll go, okay, we'll go purchase it. And then they, they almost like do nothing with it once it's purchased. So this thing was like explosive. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's the same. It's the same. Yeah. So yeah, they they purchase they purchase these um, innovative things, um, but that's that's where their sort of involvement stops. Usually, what they'll do is they'll reskin it, or you know, and when I say reskin it, like put a ribbon in, um, or you know, connect it to a cloud server or something like that. They're um, they're very they don't put a lot of money into developing the software because it's risky. It, it it's it's very risky. Um, like if you look at all the bugs that Rhino might have over its development, like they're constantly repatching it. Blah blah blah. Autodesk just basically go, no, nah, that like we're done. This is this is stable. We're going to try and keep it stable. Um, so. Well, that's the thing though, right? So like competition is the the competition against these guys. Like if you're a small company, Autodesk has enough money to just come by, right? Yeah. And like even if you're like even if you're like me and like if I were to start if I made a new CAD package, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to make a new CAD package and I want it to be amazing. And I set out and then Autodesk comes along and says, hey, we're going to pay you like $20 million for this. I'm not sure I could say no, right? Even though I've gone in with the best intentions. That, uh, yeah, like $20 million is quite a lot of money, right? <laughs> it's... Yeah. Either, but it's hard to say no. But, 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 what, how does Autodesk offer money to someone, someone who doesn't own anything? Like, how does Blender, Blender's not necessarily owned by anyone, right? So, so Blender is open source and Blender has blindingly become used by a lot of people because it's free um, and people are recognizing it more and more as uh, like a an industry standard package. Um, like people use it to make to make video games um, and like I like I watched a video being used on it the other day and it's like live render engine is fucking amazing. It's awesome. Um, and so, and this is people just contributing like free, like their open source stuff to it. So that I think, I think what's going to end up happening is that op eventually over time, open source is just going to get too good that Autodesk is going to have to compete against it. And the main problem is going, the, the only way that they're going to be able to solve that problem is by hiring the people working on that 
um, and getting them to work on Autodesk stuff. The thing is, they like, which is solving both, it's solving the problem because they're hiring people that are doing development, right? So, well, I think open source is going to solve that. But back to my story. Um, Autodesk keep, they, they keep having these sort of like interoperability issues because of what they, what they do. They, they invent something or they buy something and then they kind of like wash their hands of it. So there's their, their attempt at trying to make some kind of like, uh, open file format for BIM was this file format called IFC. It stands for industry foundation class. Um, they kind of invented it and then they dropped it. So they don't care about it anymore. There's this other organization that, that kind of runs it. Um, the thing is Autodesk, they don't care about it enough that if um, you try and save a file out of Revit to IFC and there's a, like there's a problem, then Revit just, it just stops. It just stops writing the IFC. Or if you try to import something and there's a bug or whatever, it just stops. It doesn't, it doesn't actually debug and they haven't followed it through. So interoperability doesn't necessarily exist with Revit at all. You can't import something into Revit um, or export something out of Revit directly using Revit's tools and have that work as a BIM model. So people have been trying, other than IFC, but IFC is obviously buggy. So people have spent quite a long time, like almost the first thing I did as I came out of uni, um, so in 2011, I, I came into Cox Architecture in Adelaide and I was doing designs for Adelaide Oval uh, in Rhino and there were like four people tracing the work that I was modeling in Rhino in Revit. Like they were doing other stuff, but it was like this one guy has to have like four other people doing the Revit work to match what I've done. Like this is custom plinths, custom plinths for the, the props um, and like the the ceilings that were uh, that we were putting into the um, into the um, banquet halls and the indoor cricket center was completely designed in Rhino. Um, and someone had to redraw that Rhino design in Revit. Um, the, there's these V columns that sit in the front of the, like on the Southern facade, they're all Rhino design columns that had to be redrawn in Revit. It was frustrating. The roof was even drawn in Rhino and someone had to trace that roof design. Um, I feel like I'm just talking to Jason right now, but if, uh, because Jason might know what Adelaide Oval is, but, um, but everyone else who isn't in Adelaide right now, see all of this struck, these structural elements, someone was drawing them manually tracing a Revit model. And back then, if you were to bring the center lines into Revit and then try and draw a structural line, Revit would immediately take that line and project it onto the working plane because it, that, like it just says, the working plane is the start. So you would have to pick the line that would place it in, in the XY plane and then manually drag it to the, the right height. And it was just like, what the fuck? Like we're wasting all this time um, for to do a good design um, because the tool that we're using is not the right tool to do this design. It just doesn't work. But we had we have to supply this design via Revit. So um, the thing is, geometry is just maths. So if you can if you can turn your grasshopper geometry into numbers and send those numbers over to Revit and have Revit redraw those numbers like using set of instructions, very similar to the laser cutter or 3D printer, you know, go to this location and inject or cut a line from this point to this point. 
you can get Revit to redraw what you've drawn in Rhino, but native to Revit. Back then, Dynamo didn't exist, so we were using C Sharp and Revit to um, draw the lines. But then, when Dyna someone released Dynamo, we were using Dynamo to do that. People have made lots of different plugins for interoperability. There's like Chameleon. Um, there's Geometry Gym that uses the IFC class. Um, Le uh, Leo, what does does HDR use anything? Cox has just recently bought Beam. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, there was there was like a year or two of this company called Flux um, that was trying to do it through a web server. People have tried to invent like speckle systems. I personally have like uh, I re uh, repurposed a file format called GeoJSON, which is used by the like by planning um, and mapping. I just added a third dimension to that and used that as a standardized file format to send between the two systems. And then I just had deserializers. The thing was people, people were like, it's too hard. Like you need to know, you need to know all this, like these steps and these methods to be able to get them to talk. At the same time that this is all happening, Rhino eventually becomes, no, a Grasshopper eventually becomes non-work in progress. So I think it was Rhino 7, no, Rhino 6, that it was actually a non-work in progress uh, plugin. It was part of Rhino, it wasn't a plugin, it just came with it. But at the same time, uh, this plugin for Rhino called T splines. Um, if I if I remember correctly, so so this uh, T splines allowed you to do uh, this sub D modeling, which which allowed for like I guess more of these like you can see this T spline model is a lot simpler than than the NURBS one. The NURBS one's going to have a lot of trouble dealing with these like intersections because no, every NURB surface has to be four sided. So, but a, a T like a sub D mesh doesn't. It's just um, it can be any number of meshes that are just smoothed into approximated NURBS geometry. Um, Autodesk bought T splines and discontinued it for Rhino. Um, and, uh, that happened like around Rhino 6. Um, so we're now like, we've now got Rhino 7, but in Rhino 6, Autodesk bought T-Splines, discontinued it on Rhino 6, because they, they couldn't discontinue it on 5 because it'd been released, but they discontinued it on 6. So, um, and I've got this picture up for a reason. Um, if you're McNeil and all you care about is building boats, um, you were probably using T splines, right? You were, you made software and then someone else made this really good plugin that allowed you to do this like hull modeling, and then Autodesk came along and purchased it, and then discontinued it, and it makes your job harder to build boats. So McNeil just said, "Well, we'll just add sub D modeling to Rhino 7." So that that's why there's sub D modeling now in Rhino Seven because uh, someone purchased T splines and discontinued it. Um, and then the other thing was there was there's this uh, there's another BIM package called um, I forgot what it's called. What's the um? It's called Archi. What's what's that other BIM arch architecture package, Leo? Archicad. That's right. Okay, so Archicad, owned by Graphisoft, is probably the the closest competitor to Revit um, on the market. Huh? Closest competitor. It's it's the only other well, it's the only other BIM package that is reasonably cheap. 
There are other BIM packages like um, oh yeah, my, yeah, all these like micro sessions, but they cost like ten, like twenty thousand dollars a license, and like architecture firms just aren't willing to pay it. Um, so these guys are. These guys, what they did was they they recognized how good Rhino and Grasshopper was, and they put effort into making um, like a bespoke connection. So you could run Grasshopper separately to running Archicad and have Grasshopper connect um, and control Archicad. But the thing was, there was quite a lot of effort there from Graphisoft's perspective. But McNeil, McNeil basically said, "Hey, we're recognizing that people want to use our tools with their with their software, like Graphisoft. What we'll do is we'll just flick a switch on Rhino that allows you to run Rhino inside other packages. So, um, so Rhino Seven basically flicked that switch, that that um, security layer, because." From their perspective, if Rhino is like people were buying Rhino purely because it was controlling Archicad, so they were able to sell more Rhino licenses because Archicad enabled it. So from their perspective, hey, we can make we can make more money just by flicking a switch and allowing people to run Rhino like a plugin, and so that's what they've done. They've they've just said we'll flick that switch, you can run it. Um, Revit seems to be the the one asshole in all of this. Like Autodesk seems to be the one asshole. Why not get one of our guys to just demonstrate how powerful this can be, this Rhino inside, by developing it in into Revit, which is what they've done. And as well, because they their market, like their market would grow so much. Because there's so so many people are mandating Revit on projects. Revit Autodesk spend money um, lobbying governments to mandate Revit. Rhino's just going to piggyback off the tails of that and also be like a big fuck you for buying T spines. Um, but this is the cool thing because. What they've done is they've approached it the same way that they've always approached Rhino and Grasshopper. It's not targeting a specific thing. It's Rhino inside, not Rhino inside Revit. So Rhino inside runs in anything. What that means is... People are able to run Rhino inside the Unreal Gaming Engine. Um, which I haven't I haven't played with yet because um, it does require a little bit of uh, coding, but you can see here they're they they're literally baking meshes directly into Unreal with a pretty poor frame frame rate. But if you think about it, they they're not they're not just targeting Revit; they're targeting anything that can run uh, a .NET program. So you could technically run Rhino inside Photoshop or Illustrator or um, Excel. Like I don't know why you would, but do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's just about. I mean, it's quite most most people are doing it more on the Yeah, 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 yeah. It's basically it. It is basically hey, we want to we want to run Grasshopper inside this other package. The thing is, what what's what's really cool is it gives it also gives uh, a package like Revit or Unreal access to Rhino's geometry API. So uh, Revit doesn't necessarily have the ability to like work out complex intersections between two surfaces, but you could technically write a plugin using Rhino inside. That doesn't require any Rhino or Grasshopper knowledge. That just says, "Hey, Revit, take these two objects and use this this API system to work out what that intersection is." So it, it's giving people more people the tools that they're they're looking for. 
The other thing I find though is a lot of like almost 80% of my office wants to learn Grasshopper. They're like, that seems like it's really cool and powerful. And then you sit down and you go, well, this is a list and this is a branch and this is how they connect. And look, we can draw some lines between them and make something complex. And they say, well, far out, this is a very steep learning curve. I need to be able to use this now to be able to learn it because I've got a deadline tomorrow and I don't have time to learn how to draw like what a line is or what a mesh is and how they intersect and what they can do. So the I think what a Grasshopper inside Revit is going to do is it's going to open up that visual coding world of Grasshopper to the the Reviteers of the world that want to learn it. That, that, and they just can't because there just hasn't been a very easy interface between them. Now, it's like you open up Rhino in Revit, open up uh, the Grasshopper thing, and there's a, like, as Leo mentioned, it used to be very hard to go get the bounding geometry of a room in in Rhino inside. But now someone's written the component, you drop it in, it's like four components and you've got your geometry to work with. So I think I think we're going to see a bit of a um, a boom in uh, gr grasshopper users in the industry now that you can run it inside Revit and you can run it for free inside Revit. It's um, as long as you've got a Rhino license, it's free to run inside. Well, that was half an hour of talking about the history of Rhino and Revit. Yeah. No, no, because every people, most people are idiots. Um, that's the wrong word. Self. So look, I'm self-taught. I I'm self-taught with Grasshopper. I'm sure Leo's also self-taught. Um, most industry people are self-taught. You guys aren't. You're taught by um, people that the university has some way that think are actually reasonable at this stuff and hired to teach you, right? So there's there's at least a little bit of a, a standard um, in what's being taught. Most coding people don't have a direct coding support person to learn off in the industry they're usually sort of tinkering around and just using their own their own ideas they're googling stuff they're there's sort of it's a very it's a weird world i kind of liken it to um the way language developed in indonesia so um generally there's this like language that exists but if uh, everyone kind of just stays to the little island um, that each language gets like a their own idiosyncrasies or, or dialects and they they vary from group to group so as long as you stay by yourself as long as you're like a finch on the Galapagos Islands you're off by yourself you become your own little thing and now I'm not saying dialects in Indonesia are bad but um, it's very hard to communicate across the whole group. Like if you, if one Indonesian native goes to another, they can't really talk to each other. Even though they're using the same language, they're using grasshopper, let's say, their, their techniques in it are not the same. And there are some people that just give up on having good standards in grasshopper. So for example, uh, I've seen, I don't know how to resort these panels on this facade. It's too hard. Like at the moment, the, they're sorting left to right across the facade and I need them to sort up and down for this next part of the script to function. So um, someone who's who understands the fundamentals of Grasshopper would say, okay, well, we have to analyze the list and break it down and flip it or do whatever 
to the structure of the list. But far too many people who are self-taught will bake the geometry and then manually go through and re-enter it back into Grasshopper to get it into the order that they need it to be in. So like that's just one minor thing. There's thousands, I've, I've seen thousands of bad practices with self-taught people. So um, when, when you say, um, is it a problem that you guys, like that there's going to be even more people wanting to use Grasshopper out there? No, because you guys are actually going to know how to use it, especially Revit is a, Revit is a pain in the ass to model in. You, you have to know how Revit works to model in Grasshopper for Revit, right? So knowing how objects work in, in a computer, Revit's just sort of said, oh, we'll make it user-friendly, just draw a line, we'll make a wall. Now you guys need to know, okay, what are the instructions that we need to give for, it, for that to work? So I think, I think you've actually got a massive edge up. And on top of that, there are people out there that want to use it, that need someone to be there, to be that like pinnacle of skill so that they can learn. So I think it's probably going to make you guys even more valuable. Pardon? I'm I'm not a registered architect, but yeah, I do. I work I work for Cox Architecture. I work on architects. I I've done an architecture degree. I'm just not registered. No, uh, uh, no, no. Registrations a pub public safety measure. It's it's purely there for because we we give advice to people that could have a major financial or safety risk for them so um i could i could play i could specify a tile that has the wrong slip resistance and someone could fall over and break their neck and no 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 so who gets sued because i gave the owner I gave the owner the um, advice to put that tile down. So it's actually, I'm the one who gets sued. So I need insurance to practice. An insurer won't insure me unless they know I'm registered because that registration is a, is a stamp of approval to say this is a person who can um, practice in a non-liable fashion. Um, look, an architecture degree is five years. It's, it's not three. You, you very, it's very few firms will hire you with a, with a three year degree. They expect you to go through the five years. Um, you will learn more in those five years than you will learn in the three of this degree. Um, but, but, but what I've found with my architecture degree was it was actually just a, a platform for me to explore and learn um, with, with like the fact that there's critical people. What I mean by critical is in criticizing your work. Um, so that's how, like they never taught me grasshopper at uni. I taught myself grasshopper at uni and I used uni to teach like, as a as a way to use grasshopper to produce outcomes that were then judged because if you just use grasshopper to fiddle with cool geometries it's not you're not going to put yourself through that pressure test of getting marked and like you you need to produce something good with it to actually know how to use it well Kind of, 
kind of what you're trying to do in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Look. Yeah, but you will. You will have. This is the thing. The architecture degrees are also bad at that. Okay. the The problem, the problem, the problem. It mainly lies in the fact that universities, um, universities aren't necessarily about education um like um so like leo for example leo's a really good example actually leo's a phd student um but he's also someone who works in a in an industry firm like a fairly significant one like hdr it's international um most people doing a phd are usually doing PhDs to to get into the academic world as a career because you you cannot be hired as a full-time employee at UNSW unless you have a PhD. So um, Hank and Nicole, they've both got PhDs. Um, Leo, um, and I'm, I'm just... I'm just assuming this, I don't actually know this with Leo, but I feel like Leo probably would rather be uh, an associate professor or professor one day rather than a lead architect on a project because he's doing a PhD. It's that, it's just, you have to do that. I, I don't know anyone who needs to do a PhD to, to get into architecture, but you need a PhD to get into um, the, that academic career. And so, you'll find that the way universities work, they need academics to do something other than just be academics. They need them to educate. And so Christina, as an example, um, is an academic. She's, you know, this close to finishing her PhD. She might even have it. I don't, I don't know, actually. But she hasn't worked in industry as much as what, I guess, my, myself or, or Leo has. And so um, that's why you, you're getting like a skewed look of the of the world from a computational perspective. That that applies in architecture as well. There's plenty of tutors and uh, course coordinators that are pure academics in architecture. And the thing that they usually are like when you get into academia and architecture, it's usually to do with like architectural history. So you you end up with this almost like um, education of people who care about architecture for the sake of like the pureness of architecture. So they very much care about um, like architectural history figures. So, you know, and that's that's kind of where I think a lot of the culture of architecture with a capital A comes from is that the university system. I like. I felt like it was almost like I was in a cult when I was at uni. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> yeah. Look, it's it work. It kind of it works though. Like if you if you can work that out very soon, then you can you can use the degree to your own purposes. I think. So, not and that being said, look, I learnt stuff in my architecture degree that was real stuff. Like we learnt about passive design techniques. Um, uh, we learnt about building services and all like I guess a lot of the stuff that I'm trying to cram into a single course here um, like we learnt over five years um, the problem with this course I think is that it is a middleman course between a lot of things like it's urban planning it's architecture it's interior design 
they're bringing engineers in. It's it's kind of like it's going to get spread too thin. Um, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, but that's the thing. So, are you? So, but that you're coming in like I, I'm very much talking about architecture, right? Leo's Leo's going to take you guys through into urban planning more next term, um, and that's why we've, we've we're kind of covering some urban planning stuff this term as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the the other class is purely about urban planning. Uh, not exactly. No, no, I'm talking about the one that. Um, it's about. about uh, I don't know what you're talking about. No, no, ju just tell me what it's about. It's the one that. Right. So look, one one thing that I think is the most important thing about being a computational designer and and look that I've had enough experience with software engineers now to know that they're very different. Like a computational designer is actually able to look at uh, the whole scenario and actually work out logical, computational, algorithmic, procedural, whatever um, particular thing needs needs to actually work to solve the problem. We're, act we're actually just exceptionally good problem solvers. Um, we know how to solve problems in, an, in a fast way. Um, and so the things that you might be learning about urban planning from Nicole um, even though they might not seem like they are, um, like you you mentioned analysis, right? Yeah. That like the ability to analyze data and actually collect information and actually work out what you need to need to do with that information. It's almost it's it's very important. Um, yeah, so the the thing is, I, I think you guys, I think as well, Nicole's probably trying to, what, you guys, you guys haven't been given the opportunity to do problem solving. Like last year, um, you were shown how to code, but you weren't shown how to problem solve with code. Yeah, yeah. And so, um which means last year all you were doing was you were learning how to code with visual coding. You weren't learning computational design. Now you've been you've been given um, pro like the problem of architecture. Okay, we we need architecture that works, or we need a street section that works, and we need to use code to produce the the outcome. Um, and at the moment we're letting you do the the actual design so it's the your brain it's our human brain that's designing we're just using the computer to deliver that design um, eventually as we get further into the degree we might see the computer providing the design rather than than the brain but that requ that requires you know the ability to be able to actually understand the problems to be able to teach the computer how to solve them so I Yeah. Yeah. Well, next next term, I'm very conf I'm pretty sure I didn't fail that many people last year with the my next terms class. Next term, it's just going to be like six of you guys and me. So, 
I'm thinking we we can that's enough students for us to just make a bespoke course. So we can do whatever you guys want. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, so, yeah, yeah, look, we, yeah, so you're talking about, you're talking about sort of, uh, right now we're relying on other people to make tools for us, and eventually we want to be able to make our own tools. Um, and the, the, the that's really that's a very that's a very open ended problem, um, and I think like I've been talking a little bit about that the problems here where I've been like okay, I don't want to do it this way because there might be a problem down the line. We have to write this code so that it can handle maybe curves, for example, or we have to write this code so it can maybe handle like uh, a stair that's rotated forty five degrees or a, like a, a curvy stare, you know, like we, we want to write scripts that can handle those problems. So, um, and the, it's that type of thinking that you have to use when you start making tools for people, because you have to, you have to think about all the different um, uh, scenarios that that tool might be used. So the last thing I want you guys to do is build plugins with like four inputs that give you an outcome. And usually what you want is you want to build plugins that are provide like little supportive tools that you can use to build and like your outcome based on bespoke requirements, you know? So we'll, we can definitely talk about that next term. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, you're a you're a mature age student, right? You've yeah. so you've what education system have you gone through prior to this, or you've? Yep. Okay. Yeah, ones ones that don't necessarily have um, like degree entry. Yeah. Yeah, no, that yeah, I get that. Yeah, um, I've got friends like that um so yeah it ma that makes sense adelaide's adelaide's one of those places where you just it's who you know right it's what school you went to yeah, yeah. Actually, I really like the 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 yeah only high that's like not not to be weird for everyone but that's like um literally like a kilometer away from where I went to high school. I went, I, no, no, I went to Concordia. Tucked away just down the road. I could, it could have been Herbre, but no. So just, just so you know, I have, um, there's a guy in Cox, Sydney, um, who's, uh, he's running the Sydney football stadium, uh, planning team. Um, he, he went to Unley. Uh, he would have graduated the same year as me, 2006. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Jewelry. Yeah. Urban planning. Industrial industrial design. Um Yeah. Yeah, there it's it's all over. Yeah. Yeah. 
No. Uh, it's going... You, you're going to see it in industries that aren't even for design. You're going to see it in, like, uh, law, for example. Yeah. So, we've... Um, uh, we did... S a while ago, we did some research with uh, two students from UNSW who... They're, they're now working for us at Cox. They... Um, they were basically trying to create a 3D model of the planning laws for the city of Sydney. Um, and their, their research was really about, okay, law, like the law should be, sh it shouldn't be a prose text. It should be a code. Because like everyone has to distill that prose text and repeat it for every design process, like if you just made code that was approved as law, then people could put something into it and know whether or not it's like the conditions are met. Yeah. And so like we, we're able to do that from a very easy perspective with geometry because, you know, we're used to it. But if you think about it, um, you could technically code um, contract law. Why not? Why not have a code that defines a contract instead of, um, you know, a document? And the the code produces the document, but at the same time, the code's there. It's like it's a set of logic. Yeah. So, uh, I th what Jason's talking about is visual coding. Visual coding, I think, is what is going to open coding up to the world. Um, but then at the same time, the power of what code can do is becoming more available to everyone. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like for example, I think like obviously you, once you know how to code visually um it's you can sort of move into houdini and learn that and houdini obviously is going to be dealing with lists a little bit differently to grasshopper but once you get your head around how it deals with its data you can then manipulate that data then the probably the best um tool like component making language um, i would say is python um just as long as it's being implemented everywhere so I don't know if Houdini's got Python. Um, it looks like it. Yeah. But um, JavaScript and, and Python are becoming uh, some of the most popular um languages um they're just very uh user friendly in how their syntax works yeah like if you you go for loop in python and then for loop in c 
let's do C++. <laughs> So this doesn't even iterate over um, like a list of things, but basically you're actually writing a while loop and then in the while loop you have to um, test for the length. So here it's saying uh, if i is less than, than 5, we're good, but once it is larger than 5, you have to you stop the loop. So if you've got a list of five, five items, you have to go measure the length of the list and write it into the syntax. And um, you have to worry about end of line conditions and stuff like that. Python, Python's like a, it uses formatting to help define things. So that the tabbing that, that you do when, you, when you're doing like an inbound of a for loop, um, it visually tells people that, that you're inside the for loop. Uh, whilst there's a huh? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, mind you, it's not like it is. It's a bit of a hack system to work on Windows, but um, maybe when Microsoft will actually change that. I know it's probably the one thing that Mac does better than Windows, in my opinion is that they actually use a, um, that Linux, therefore Python uh, coding environment. <clears throat> uh, with Ben. Ben's yeah, Ben's approach. Ben's approach is that um, the process of teaching Python should just teach computer science. So um, it's a sub I know, I know, but it's someone. It's someone else's job to teach you guys how to apply the computer science that you learn with Python to problems. That's Ben's opinion. Um, Nicole, who's very good friends with Ben, is trying to get him to change that opinion. But yeah. Well, the yeah, the, the, the other problem is at the same time, there's another person teaching you guys how to use Grasshopper, but not teaching you how to apply it contextually. So like that it, it was, the, the thing was COVID just meant that last year you ended up with Christina for three, three terms when normally you would only have her for one. Um, and so which is also why there's only six of you. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. It's good. It's actually okay. Uh, so what I found out from Nicole, because I ended up talking to Nicole about this. Um, I bumped into her and we, we were like, what the fuck? What's, what's happened to this class? Um, what used to happen was a lot of people who were interested in architecture but couldn't get the ATAR to get in, they would come do computational design. And in the first in the first year, they would be convinced to stay in the course rather than go to architecture. Yeah. Okay. They're like, oh, this is actually, this is where we, sh we we're lucky that we didn't get into architecture because um, we yeah but no i think i think the thing is you you've come f i if i went and did my architecture degree again right now um without the skill set just with the mindset of being working in the industry i think i could do it in half the time cuz i'm i'm used to doing like 
60 hours a week on something. And I remember being told that, you know, a double unit course would meant that you should be doing at least 40 hours a week on it. And it was like, no, I'm going to do this in the last week of the assignment, Stu, right? Like most students. That's what most... <clears throat> That's what most of you guys are doing, right? Because you've got assignments due every week. And so you, you just have a priority list. Maybe if you get bored writing an essay, you'll go fiddle with Grasshopper on this assignment. But there's an assignment due at the end of the week. You, you, you might as well focus on that. Um, what am I trying to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so a lot of a lot of Christina just basically set the learning curve too high. And so there's all these students that are like, I want to design houses or buildings or whatever. I want to be an architect. And she's going hyperbolic paraboloids and geodesic domes and they're like, I don't see how this applies to the fact that I want to be an architect. They don't they don't see that connection and it's interesting like um paolo mentioned that he doesn't he wants to get into like graphics or video games or something like that Render, rendering. rendering and like it it seems as if most of the people that have stayed are people that are more interested in computational design uh i guess as a core than maybe that interested in it uh in application or at least like they can see the connection between what it is and I'm talking I'm literally putting words in your mouth I feel like you guys had a have a better understanding of how you can connect this to what you want to do with your with your lives that's pro that's the only that's the only reason that you stayed Yeah. <laughs> well, there, yeah, as well, like I've, I've taught that class. Um, to non-computational design students. This was before Christina had changed it a bit. Um, and for me, it was it was like trying to encourage them to think uh, differently about their whole degree, almost. So um, you guys had to do like a waffle, right? Like a like a slotted waffle. Back back when I back when that course was being run by someone else, that someone else and this is kind of why you remember when I stood up and I said, This is my agenda? I want you to be aware of what my agenda is because because I think that's important. Like as long as you know what I care about, then you you can be a better student for me or at least you can know how to deal with me. Right? There I've worked for teachers in the past whose agendas were there's like an exhibition at the end of the year and they just want good work to get into the exhibition. Uh, um, and so they don't, they don't care necessarily about how people get the outcome. They just want a good outcome for the exhibition. And so this, we had to teach um, waffling and I taught waffling my way, which is using Brasshopper, not using any of the um, the contouring methods, but actually using proper intersections and learning about orientation and um, doing doing the waffling in 2D somewhere else using orientation methods and stuff like that. And the other class, 
um, was encouraged to use this thing called 123D Make, which is discontinued, I think. <coughs> so it, it's, it's like this web application where you bring a model in, like a mesh model, um, and it will it'll do all the waffling basically for you. You just basically change some of the sliders here and you get the outcome that you need. And most of my class were like architecture students and they were like, the other class gets to use this program called 123D Make. Why, like, why can't we just do that? It seems so much easier. And, and that, that's currently what kind of the attitude is in those other degrees is you, you are there to just produce a good outcome to submit to get marked. So usually what you will do is you will use techniques that you are comfortable with to get that outcome. So um, people aren't going to use Grasshopper for that because they're worried they're not going to be able to produce the outcome in time because of the learning that's necessary. And so they'll just, they'll use whatever they need to. They'll throw it into SketchUp. They'll do all the work that they need to and to get the, get it out. And so they're not necessarily learning new skills. They, you know, they, they are learning, they are getting judged on the design. They have to do a good design, but their progression there just doesn't work. And so I said to the class, like, is there, is there literally any point in, in you sitting here plugging something into some like pre-built Autodesk tool that will do the waffling for you when, when you're in the industry and you have to section up a roof, um, you, know, you need to cut planar sections through a roof to rationalize it, to put structural elements on there. You're not going to be able to put that into 123D Make. Like the, the tools that we're giving you to, to do this waffle, they're the same tools that I would use to put a structural system on a complex geometry roof. And at the end, once, you know, they had built all these scripts that had helped them, you know, build this stuff without going to like a, um, a service, they were starting to realize like, oh, okay, uni is actually about learning. It's not about pro like proving how much effort you can put in. It's actually about proving how much you can learn. But that only applies with certain teachers. So be careful with that one. Yeah. But that, yeah. That being said, like, uh, Leo, Leo wanted to make it clear from the beginning that he, he's very interested in you guys being able to do work that you can put in your portfolios. Like, so he, he wants you to be able to, like, that's why Leo is kind of being quite stringent on how things look because he, he wants you to be able to put uh, the drawings that you've done into a portfolio and for someone at HDR to be like, ah, yes, this person, they, they've done a good script. Like that's a very, very valuable skill for us to have. And as well, they're presenting it in a good way. Um, and so that that's probably the one thing that I think the architects are learning better than you guys. Uh, it's because it's because you've got they've got five years of pr being put under a lot of pressure to produce and communicate well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing is, architecture never. I don't think they ever taught me how to communicate well. They just put me in situations where I had to learn. You know. Yeah. Do it do it again, do it again, do it again. Like you get you just get absolutely ripped to shreds in front of everyone during a crit session and it's like, okay, how do I get better? <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, no, I've uh, I've had some pretty mean arguments with uh, Philip Cox um, very early on in my my career, um, and I probably wouldn't have have had the resilience to stand up to him if I hadn't had that sort of experience at uni. I think I would have been like, I'm going to shut up. But uni taught me that um, it doesn't matter how old someone is or how established they are, they can be an idiot. So, <laughs> with <laughs> so... You were going to say something, Jason? Yeah. I agree with you. It is shitty behavior. <laughs> People, yeah, yeah. People, people told me that's that's what Philip did. Philip Cox. He he would argue with people to see see who would like stand up for themselves. Um, but he was such he was such an asshole about it. Like like he would use these awful like uh, fallacious arguments. Um, like it was like you've been in this industry for like. Five months, and I've been in it for fifty years. I'm like that doesn't change the fact that a triangle is flat, you know? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't work. It's no, no. It's just, it's not. Like from, from my like I've been building a team up at Cox of like comp des people, um, and trying to break them at every turn. It just it breaks them. Like they leave. So there there are there are I haven't done that. But there are other, there are other teams that I've seen do it, and they they just have people rolling through them, and they just constantly, like, trying to skill up those people, um, and so they're just like chasing their tail all the time. And I've I've got a team that, I don't the last person that left, um, I only just recently had someone leave it, and that was because they want to do a PhD. Um, but prior to that, someone moved to Melbourne. No one's ever left the team. Uh, oh no, one person has. Only one person has left the team, and that's because of the stuff they wanted to do just didn't wasn't going to happen at Cox. So people want to stay in our team because it's they get to do interesting things and it, there's support there. 
Um, and the thing is that they're starting to support each other now. Like I, I can kind of walk away from this team now and it will keep running. Um, that's the type of team you want to, you want to make the, a manager should like a manager managers usually worry that they're going to make a team that replaces them. And so they're worried they're going to lose their job. The thing is, if you can make a team that just runs by itself, then you, you can go do whatever it's, it's excellent. No, it's fine. Um, I'm about, I'm answering Tom's details. Present your work in a PDF document. Minimum. <clears throat> minimum two plans. One section, please. Communicate <coughs> your work in a good way. Like. You guys actually did a really, I think you guys did a really good job with the last of summer. I haven't finished marking everyone yet, but um, the, the idea that like a lot of you started to experiment with um, different means of communication, like, uh, like for example, the section perspective or um, the tables that you put in, like you, I, I know, I know you guys are a little bit worried about the fact that the, all the deliverable says is like a PDF document. Um, but, uh, you're actually, you're actually doing a really good, you're doing good. So keep, just think about how you want to communicate it. Um, use whatever tools you want to, to communicate. And, um, I think you're, you're there. You, the thing is, I'm not, I'm not going to penalize you for, not supplying those sort of tick box things. So you don't need to worry about them too much. Think about how you want to communicate your stuff. I don't, I don't think a single person submitted um, the wrong stuff. That's the other thing. Are you trying to talk to us, Leo? Oh yeah, that's, that's, that is other than like not submitting. Yeah. Yeah, but that's all. That's always going to go on. You, you talk, I'm going to be silent for a minute. Um, we can, we can next week. I was thinking about maybe, um, running people through, uh, I guess a more of like a, a non assignment related content. So I was going to run through, uh, branch structures and, and like how grasshopper deals with branches and lists and trees and stuff like that. And also talk about, um, what the different phases of a uh, urban planning and architectural project are and what usually we have to do on them. Really yeah. Because I know you and I know what a master plan is and what a concept design is and what a contract administration for construction drawing is, but these guys don't. Um, so yeah, we'll do that. Huh? 
I don't know what that is. Yeah. Oh, good. I once I once had a whole semester to write a five thousand word no ten thousand word essay. I wrote it in the first two weeks, and I spent the rest of that semester uh, getting feedback and edits and changes and stuff like that. And I I wouldn't have got the mark I got if I'd written it in the last two weeks. You can, you can, but you won't, you won't have all of the, that feedback that you, you would get. The same, the same applies. I think um, there was, yeah, there was assignment that I, I forced, uh, it was group work and I forced everyone in my group to finish all the work in the first three weeks. We spent the rest of the assignment just uh, fixing stuff up. It was the most relaxed semester ever um, because we were able to just uh, like, tweak and and finesse rather than like slam everything out by the end so yeah it's a good advice from leo or tom is that tom looks like tom <laughs> i know i'm just joking tom is that um the other tom is that enough information for you or not Um, it's two o'clock. I have to go, um, move a facade from Rhino into Revit. Not, uh, not my fault. Um, and it's been modeled by someone who I don't think knows what they're doing. Um, so I'm going to have a great afternoon. Bye.